Good morning and welcome to Casino Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Stephen Gord and I want to thank you for joining with me today. It's a great day where we can gather together and celebrate God, celebrate who he is and learn from his word. And today we're going to continue our series looking at the book of Exodus. So if you have your Bibles, you might like to turn with me to Exodus chapter 24. We're going to look at a few more chapters after that, but we're going to focus mainly on chapter 24. Now, before we get there, just a few quick announcements. Uh, next, uh, or in the next week or so, on the 19th, we will be running a Creating Safe Spaces over at Alstonville Baptist Church. If you are a leader in our church, if you want to work with children in our church or youth, then please, you must make sure you do that course. Or come and have a chat with me about it beforehand anyway. So any information, come and see me. Also, the North Coast Christian women are putting on a conference and my beautiful wife, Greta, she's going to be speaking at it. It's all going to be online this year over two different Saturdays. The first Saturday, again, is the 19th. So if you'd like to uh, log in and hear Greta share from the book of Galatians, then please get again get in contact with me or have a look at our website or facebook page and you might be able to find some information there great ways that we can outside of church that we can learn about god and learn about how we can serve our community so my encouragement is to seriously consider those things also please keep praying keep praying for our church keep praying for our great community of casino but also for all those others who are struggling at this time, whether it's through COVID-19, whether it's health issues, financial issues, whatever it might be, please be in prayer. Also remember our teachers and our year 12 students at the moment as well, as they are getting ready to sit their HSC. Big challenges this year for them, big steps going ahead, but a prayer. Please pray for them that in the midst of the stress, in the midst of looking at what they might think is a big step into the future and what they're going to do with the rest of their lives, that they don't forget the most important thing in life is to love and follow God. So please pray for that. And if you have an opportunity, speak into the lives of the young people who are doing their HSC. Support them, pray for them and encourage them as they come to know about God. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me today to Exodus chapter 24. Now last week, you would remember I challenged you in very hard parts of Exodus 23, 21 through to chapter 23, where God expanded on what the Ten Commandments were and gave more instruction of how to worship Him and how to live for His people day by day. And some of those, I said, some of the laws that were there looked really strange and really difficult for us to understand for our culture. So I encouraged you to go away and look at them for yourself, to see how you could read them and apply them to your life today. Now, remember, I said in some of the cases, it is really hard to do. So in those cases, remember the bigger picture. Think of the Ten Commandments. Love God and love each other. And as we love God more, we should love each other more. So think about it when you come to God's word. How does it tell me to love God more? And how does it tell me that I can love others more? And maybe that is a beginning, particularly in the hard parts of the Old Testament, that we can apply God's word to our life today. So today, we're going to get to look at Exodus chapter 24. And as we come to look at this chapter, and as I was praying through it and thinking about it during the week, I was struck, it's very easy to look at this chapter and think, it's a nice historical document. You know, it gives the history of God speaking to his people and giving them some information. And we might think, that's it. We might think, that's all it is. It is just history. But the more I prayed about it and reflected on it, the more I realized that Exodus chapter 24, it's not just an ordinary chapter. This chapter is one of the most extraordinary in the whole Bible. Well, let me give you a bit of an idea of why I think that. Now, it's extraordinary because when we think about God, we think God is unseen. 
We might even think when we read the Bible that God never really appears to anyone. This series that we've looked at, moving on, moving by faith, God has spoken to Moses out of a burning bush and God has already met out of a cloud with Moses. We know that God has said, I will be with you as a group of people. And he led them at night as a pillar of flame and in the daytime as a pillar of smoke. So in a way, symbolically, we could say a couple of people have got to see God. But here, here in Exodus chapter 24, a whole bunch of people get to see God. And not just get to see him, but sit down and have a meal with him. Now this is extraordinary. And when you look at the description in this chapter of, of God, it's amazing. Now this chapter is different. But you know the old TV ad? You know the old TV ad where they would try to sell you something and they'd go, wait, there's still more. Well, in Exodus chapter 24, we get that as well. Because here, this chapter is noteworthy because God passes on the stone tablets, the Ten Commandments to Moses and the people. And he goes on and he talks about a covenant being made here. And you're gonna, we're going to unpack this in more detail, what it's actually going to look like. But this covenant, what we are often known as the Mosaic Covenant, because Moses is the one who's doing the direct interaction with God, this covenant in chapter 24 here of Exodus is so important, not just to the understanding the rest of the book of Exodus, but it's hugely important to understand the Old Testament. And more than that, now, you might not 100% agree with me, but hopefully I've had to point it out to you later on. I think if we don't understand this, then we will struggle to actually understand who Jesus was and what he did for us at the cross. Because remember, Jesus didn't say he, I, he came to abolish. He said he didn't come to abolish the Old Testament, but to fulfill it. And if he came to fulfill it, then we need to know about it. And when he's talking about that, he's talking about Exodus chapter 24. So can you start to see that not just this chapter being a history or a reflection on Israel's history or what's happening in their culture, this is hugely important. This is not just an ordinary chapter tucked in between chapters 23 and 25 of Exodus. From this moment on in the Old Testament, things are going to change for God's people. Exodus chapter 24 and the covenant that they are going to make or God makes with them is so huge, it changes and affects the rest of the Bible. This chapter is not ordinary. This chapter is extraordinary. And my prayer is today as we unpack it, you'll get to see that too. Now I've just mentioned the word covenant that Moses and God made a covenant and God made it this covenant with his people. A couple of weeks ago when I looked at Exodus chapter 19, I mentioned uh, that God was looking at making a verbal covenant with his people back then. And maybe you've been thinking, well, what is this word covenant? Maybe you've heard uh, the marriage vows or the marriage ceremony described as a marriage covenant. And you're thinking, is that sort of what we're talking about? And in a very small imperfect, maybe not really, uh, type of way. Yes, it is. But a covenant is much more than that. Now, historically, the nations around Israel at this time, they made covenants. Uh, important people made covenants together. They made covenants between countries. They made covenants between uh, kings and, and their gods. Covenants were made. And covenants were where a promise or a vow was made by someone. I will do this. And then it was signed in some way. It was sealed in some way that this was a promise that was going to happen. And to do the signing and sealing, they often had a sacrifice. And when an animal was burnt, they then took the uh, parts of the burnt or cooked animal, and then they would sit down and enjoy that in a meal together. They would eat together, they'd have the sacrifice, and then they would build something or do something that would say, from this day forward, we are going to remember this forever. 
They're going to set up a memorial. Now, a promise is made, a sacrifice, meal, memorial, but there's one last little part. And that last little part of the covenant is if the covenant is broken, then a curse would fall on the person who broke the covenant. Their consequences, severe consequences for breaking a covenant. A covenant is not a small thing. A covenant is serious business. So if you've glanced through at Exodus chapter 24, or if you've read it before, do we actually see those elements here in the text? Well, if we glance through, we see that a promise or a vow is being made. There's a sacrifice. There's a meal. There's a memorial built. Sounds like a covenant, doesn't it? And even in one of the early verses of chapter 24, it says Moses went away and wrote the book of the covenant which I think is probably the last couple of chapters we looked at last week, chapters 21 to 23, where God is giving the law, God is expanding on how to live out the Ten Commandments, and I think that's what Moses is writing down. And also, from now on, what we're going to read through the rest of this book and into uh, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, it's all unpacking the law. And I think that is what Moses here is writing down. This is serious business. Now, just a quick aside. When you think about covenants, when's the first covenant do you think in the Bible? Well, let me give you a hint. The last couple of days, we've had a little bit of rain, which has been a real blessing. And maybe when you looked up in the sky, you saw something. Does that give you an idea what the first covenant was? Remember, in back in the book of Genesis, in chapters 8 and 9, God was so angry with his people that he brought judgment on them. They made a choice. They didn't want to know anything about God except one family, Noah's family. So God brought a flood that destroyed the people. Noah and his family and those in the ark, they were the ones who survived. And God said, from this day forward, I will not do this again. I will not bring a flood upon the earth like this to destroy mankind. And I'll prove it. I will promise it. I will give you something so that you will not forget this today. And he put a rainbow into the sky. That rainbow was the sign and the seal that the God had made a covenant with Noah and the future people. Now, that was a pretty big deal come to Exodus chapter 24, we get another covenant. Again, it's a pretty big deal. And when we look through chapter 4, and the way I want us to look at it today, a couple of times, God says this. He says, Then the Lord said to Moses. Now, God calls on Moses. God calls on the people at the base of Mount Sinai, and he tells them something, and he wants them to respond. So today, what call is God putting on them? Now, verse 1, we read that. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance. But Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. From verse 1, God makes a call on Moses and the people. And what he's going to ask them to do is to come up the mountain. He's going to sign and seal the covenant with them. But right from the very beginning, and one of the things you'll find in the covenants in the Bible, is that almost in every single situation that I can think of, God is the one who instigates it. God is the one who says, I want a covenant with you. I want you to agree to this covenant I'm presenting to you today. God's in charge. And we see that in these verses. God calls them to come up the mountain. And notice the distinction here. He sets up this distinction of how people are to approach God. Moses comes closer. Then you've got some of the other elders. And then the people are a lot further behind. Now, this distinction carries actually all the way through the Old Testament. Now, in a short little while, as part of the covenant, God is going to tell his people that he want, 
wants to visibly show that he's living with them. And he's going to do that by building something called a tabernacle. It's like a movable tent. So God is going to say wherever they move, they are to set up this tent and visibly that is where they would come to worship him. So the tabernacle, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while, is going to get set up. And so for the rest of the book of Exodus, Moses is going to write down all the fine details about how to build the tabernacle. A movable home for God. But when we read that, again, we get this distinction. Moses or the high priest can enter the tabernacle. Then you have the priests a little bit further back. And then you have the leaders. Later on, when we reach the times of the kings, the monarchy in the Old Testament, when we think of Saul, we think of David, we think of King Solomon. In that time, when they build the temple, what do we see? The exact same thing again. We see that the high priest can is the only one that can enter the Holy of Holies. Then we see that the priests can be in certain parts. The Jews can be in other parts. And if you're a Gentile, well, you're almost outside or in the back door. And you're a long way away from the Holy of Holies. Again, we see this segregation. But this is where it begins. This is how God is saying as we go through the Old Testament, this is the way. I want you to worship me. So God issues the call. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to come up the mountain. We're going to sign and seal the covenant. And in verse 3 to 8, we get the people's response. In verse 3, like back in verse 19, we get the verbal response. Yes, Lord, we'll do whatever you say. Then they build a memorial. Then there are sacrifices and the sprinkling of blood. Let's just briefly look at the sacrifices and the blood. Verse 6 and following. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls. The other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, which he just wrote, and read it to the people. They responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. You can't get a better answer than that. Verse 8. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now, just briefly, I want you to understand what is happening here. Now, when a burnt offering was made, it was normally made for the forgiveness or atonement of sin. And it was shown that God would forgive the sin. You've made the sacrifice. The people were symbolically saying, we're sorry, our sins are on that animal. It was sacrificed and then burnt. Now the other offering is the fellowship offering. This was used to celebrate that we follow and fellowship with God. We belong to God. So when Moses sprinkles the blood on the altar, it's symbolic that says God's people are forgiven for their sin. God is forgiving them because of this covenant that's been established today. And then when the blood is splashed onto the people, it represents that these people are in fellowship with God. They are God's people. Now, when I start to say some of those words, it might start to ring some bells for you. Because remember, throughout the Old Testament, we often hear God say, I am your God and you are my people. This is where it begins. This covenant, from this all the way through the Old Testament, this covenant, the Mosaic covenant, is going to hold. This is where it says, God says to them, I'm yours and you are mine. And we are signed and we are sealed by sacrifice, by blood, by memorial. A vow has been made today by God to the people and the people to God. Today, the covenant on Mount Sinai has been signed. Now, when we think about this, now the people make, again, the verbal commitment. They say, yes, God, this is us. We know that you're our God. We're going to listen to you. We're going to obey. And then they get to sit down and have a meal together. But notice again, there's that distinction. Some get to see God, but most don't. Some get to be closer to God and others don't. Now, why did God do it that way? Is it just again to show this distinction when it comes to worship him? Well, I think this time 
he was saying these people are set apart. These people, your elders, your leaders, your priests, they're different. And they are set apart. And I'm saying, God says, they should lead you. So the first 11 verses of chapter 24 are so important. This is the great covenant. This is the great promise where God says, I am your God. And the people say, yes, we will be your people. Now, we'll look at the next couple of weeks, just how quickly they, whether they can do that or not. Do they actually listen to God? Do they actually obey God? Or do they make other choices? So if you want to read ahead, feel free, you can do that. But God makes another call here. So first of all, in verse 1, he made a call for Moses and had to come up the mount. Verse 12, there's another call. Now this is going to begin what I talked about when I mentioned earlier about the tabernacle. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here. And I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandments I have written for their instruction. From this moment, when Moses goes up, he spends a long time up there on that mountain with God. Now we sort of just glance over it as we read chapters 24 and, and start going on. But Moses is up that mountain for 46 days. For 46 days he's up there on that mountain being taught things and receiving the stone tablets and other instruction from God. And the chapters that are following here in the book of Exodus are that instruction. And part of it is, and the main part is, God's going to say, you're going to worship me now differently. I'm going to give you the finite instructions. I want you to build the tabernacle. And that is how you're going to worship me. With high priest, with other priests and so forth. This is a new way that begins with this covenant of how to worship me. In chapters 25, verse 8 and 9, we see that beginning. Then have them make a sanctuary for me. And I'll dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Now, we know, and we'll look at this in other parts of the Old Testament. Now, God wasn't just locked in to that one tent. But symbolically, it said to his people, reminded them every single day, I am with you. Now, for us, just to take a little bit of an aside as we think about it, if we had God's presence, like his tabernacle in front of us, that would remind us that every single day we should obey him, right? It would remind us every single day that all the choices we make, it should be to follow God right there in front of us. Well, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, in the coming weeks, after they build the tabernacle, meet the, the directions that God says, meet the specifications, we'll get to see if they actually do it. And for us to think about, now, we have the Bible. We've seen the whole picture. We know through Jesus what God has done. Do we still listen? Do we still obey? Do we respond like God asked his people to respond back then? More of that in a moment. So God calls his people. He gives them the covenant. They are signed. They are sealed. They make the sacrifices. They do the memorial. They have the meal. God says to you, wherever you go, I am going to be with you no matter what. Now for them, their response was, everything the Lord has said, we will do. And we pray that that too is going to be our response when we think about it. And God is clearly saying, I'm your God and I want you to follow me. Now what happens here is that from this moment on, Exodus chapter 24. For us, as I said, when I first started reading this, it just seemed historical, it just seemed a general chapter. But if you talk to a Jewish person, this part of their history, receiving the Mosaic Covenant, is more important than anything because it reminds them how special, how unique they are to God. They are God's people. Here is God saying to them, I am yours. And that gives us some assurance. It gives them encouragement to not just follow him, but actually to live for him. So from this moment on, the decisions that they make in the world to keep God being number one all stems from this point. Now, being a covenant too, the flip side is if they don't do it, 
there are going to be consequences. And again, we'll look at that in a couple of weeks' time. So this chapter, it's not just history. This chapter is not just a nice little bit of culture for Israel. This chapter is not just ordinary. It's extraordinary. Now, I made the comment earlier, and when we start to think about what this might mean for us today, now God made this call on Moses and the Israelites. He says, I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. He says, he made another call and says, I'm going to be with you always. Now that hasn't changed, has it? Now I made the claim earlier, and you might think it was a pretty big claim to make, that this chapter actually affects not just the whole Old Testament, but the whole New Testament as well. Well, let me take you into the New. Let's just jump ahead to the book of Hebrews. In chapter 9, verse 1, it begins this way. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. Sound familiar? Let's go down to verse 11 and 12 of Hebrews chapter 9. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Jumping down to verse 28, a verse that many of you would know. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of the many. Now what the writer of Hebrews is making clear here, and what reason why I said Exodus chapter 24 is so important for understanding who Jesus is, that that picture, that covenant in the Old Testament comes out of Exodus chapter 24. It's an, uh, a small symbol of what Jesus would do, that it was temporary, that it was incomplete, that the covenant was not perfect, that the greater covenant, the new covenant, the one-off sacrifice for all time, for all people, would come. You didn't need the, the tabernacle to be going out in front of people to remind people that God was with the people. You didn't have to have Moses and then the elders and then the people, this hierarchy, or a high priest, then the priests, then the people. You didn't have to have this hierarchy of who could approach God with only one or two people being able to approach him directly. Now, when Jesus died, when he became that sacrifice, he tore the temple curtain, the cover that was between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple was brought down. Anyone could therefore see the Holy of Holies. Symbolically, anyone could therefore approach God. That's what Jesus did. So when he became that sacrifice, it is through him that we can say we have this God who says you will be my people and we can say we will follow you. It is only through Jesus. How do we understand that? How do we understand that he's the sacrifice? How do we understand that the old covenant is gone? Because we know from Exodus chapter 24 what the old covenant meant. As we unpack that, it shows us who Jesus is and what he came to do. He is the perfect, the complete picture, the only way to God. The incomplete was the covenant given in Exodus chapter 24. But the same call that God put on his people back then, that he wants to be your God and he wants you to be one of his people, still stands today. The people, needed to make that verbal response. They needed to make the response, everything that the Lord has said we will do. Have we made that response? Have we understood what Jesus has done? That he is that sacrifice for us? That he is the only way that we can be a part of God's family? Do we respond today in that way that says, yes, God, that's what I want. Now, it's interesting when the original covenant, Exodus chapter 24, uh, was made and all the covenants of the day, there was a memorial that was built. 
We too have a memorial for what Jesus did. Do you know what it is? Let me give you a few words from one of the Gospels. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What's a memorial that we do once a month that reminds us of what Jesus has done? We did it last week. It's the Lord's Supper. It's communion. It is something that we do on a regular basis that reminds us, gives us a memorial that we have this new covenant, that Jesus came and he fulfilled the old covenant. He perfected the old covenant. We are no longer under it. We are under him. Now the Israelites, they took encouragement. They took assurance. They were it meant something to them to say, we are God's. We are his people. I wonder how much it means to you to say you're one of God's family, that you follow Jesus. What does that mean to you? How do you show it as you live your life? Is it a message that you are so thankful for, so grateful for, so moved by, that you actually share it with others? Or maybe when you think of that memorial of communion, is it something that you just turn up on the first Sunday of the month and do and actually has lost its meaning to you? Yeah, it's reminding us that we have this new covenant. It reminds us of the greatness of God and all that God has done. It should give us assurance. It should give us encouragement that we can live for him. Yeah, later, in, in uh, again in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 10, it says this, verse 22, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Again, the words remind them of what happened back in Exodus 24. But it's not an inferior covenant. It's not something that they had to do every single year to say that they were in this relationship with God. But Jesus did it once for all. And it says that, that we should have this assurance that we can go out and live for God knowing that if we believe in what Jesus has done for us, we are part of God's family forever. Does that encourage you? Does that give you assurance to go out and live for God? Well, it should. The old covenant. Now, we need to know about that. Now, Exodus chapter 24, it's extraordinary for the Jews. Life changes from this moment on how they worship God and who they are. But it's extraordinary for us too. Because in understanding it, we get to understand the rest of the Old Testament. It helps us to understand what Jesus has done for us today. So today, you know, God back in Exodus 24 wanted to sign and seal his people through a covenant. And they remind them he would be with them forever. God wants to sign us by the death of Jesus. We can be sealed by the Holy Spirit. And again, God's going to be with us forever. Do you know that today? Do you know that he's doing that for you today? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Exodus 24. Lord, another chapter that we might just skip over. Another chapter that we might think is too hard for us to understand. But Father, we thank you for the greatness that is in it as it tells us about you and then encourages us to be the people that you want us to be. Father, forgive us when we aren't, but continue to give us a sense of boldness and peace and assurance that you're at work in our lives, in our world, in our town, in our church, in our homes. And that you want us to be your mouthpiece. That we are your feet on the ground in our community. So Father, today, we just ask that you'll help us to do that as we remember the Exodus 24. As the people all said, yes, Lord, we'll love you and obey you. Father, today, may we do that. May this week we do that. 
in your name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you again for joining us today. Don't you just love the book of Exodus? A great book in the Old Testament. Now, we've only actually got a couple of weeks left that we're going to look at Exodus. We're not going to look at every chapter from now on. And after that, we're going to start a new series. Next week, I might give you a heads up on what that series might be. Now, if there's a series that you would like to look at, a, a book in the Bible, then can I encourage you to get in touch with me? Get in touch with me and just let me know so that I can consider that as something that we can do now. My uh, thought is that you know, over the years, we'll get to study every book in the Bible in detail so that together as a family, we can learn about what God wants us to know. Now, if you want to join us again, not just next Sunday at 10 o'clock, uh, but also midweek, Wednesday night, 6.30 p.m. on Facebook Live. So you can catch up with us there as we just chat in general about the life of our town, our church, what's going on in the world, but also hopefully give some more uh, information about what is happening with COVID-19. Again, for those of you who join with us physically on a Sunday at church, Thank you very much for keeping to the guidelines and the health order that we put out. Great to see you again today. Looking forward to catching up with you next week as we look at the later chapters of the book of Exodus. So please read ahead. Thank you and may a blessing be upon all of you today in God's name. I'll see you next week.